Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Oren Davis, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Jonathan. Always a pleasure. It is a pleasure to be with you again. Longtime listeners will recognize Oren, who's joined me at least two times, maybe three times over the last few years. We've gotten to know each other, uh, and uh, it's it's been great to interact with you. And today we're going to be talking about the shifting nature of performance management. Certainly things have been changing in recent decades and in recent years around kind of best practice, what works, what doesn't work. And our experience has been pretty uniformly that most organizations are lagging in adjusting their practices to, to better suit, you know, the, the real needs and the gaps that they may be facing around performance within the organizations. So we're going to unpack all that and try to explore that together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Oren's bio with everybody. Oren Davis earned the first doctorate in positive psychology and is a self-actualization engineer who enables people to do and be their best. He consults for companies from startups to multinationals on hiring strategies, culture, innovation, diversity, equity, inclusion, and employee well-being, and coaches people at all levels on building self-knowledge and developing personal and professional growth strategies. As the principal investigator of the Quality of Life Laboratory, he conducts research on flow, creativity, hypnosis, and mentoring. Dr. Davis teaches business at Columbia University and gives workshops and lectures globally about human capital, creativity, and innovation, and positive psychology. He is a startup advisor who helps early stage companies enhance their value propositions, pitches, culture, and human capital, and writes and speaks avidly about human capital, creativity, and innovation, and positive psychology. Uh, and that's really a brief introduction, or an, anything you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in further. Uh, so yeah, uh, among other things, I've been doing a lot of work with companies, uh, especially a lot of startups lately, on how they do their hiring and uh, looking at how we can do more with DNI to pursue and inclusion because we've got a backlash against it. We're now trying to you know push back against that backlash because there re it really has got a lot of important principles that we need to be following. So I'm trying to be at the cutting edge of that and doing some new work on that and possibly even now uh, ways of measuring diversity and inclusion. Yeah, excellent, excellent, and. You know, in the pre-interview, we were chatting, um, you know, thinking maybe we would focus on the hiring piece. We decided to focus on the performance management piece, but they really are part of the same thing, right? Yeah, um, it, all it, it all goes together. And, you know, some of what I'm thinking is, you know, the the the, the book and then the movie Moneyball. Uh, for anyone who's seen that, or if you've seen that recently, I love that movie just in and of itself. It's a great movie. Um, it, it, there's a reason why it was a best picture nominee. It was just a really great movie, but from a HR and people management perspective, there are just so many great things there. Uh, and, and part of it comes back to really this, the, the nature of like, do you know what you need on your team that feeds into your recruitment, into your hiring practices, your onboarding, your performance management, et cetera, et cetera. It feeds into all of it. And yes. so after that movie came out, it, it started to popularize. You started to see more and more people talk about the money ball approach to HR or to performance management or to, to hiring and such. Uh, and I, I'm just highlighting that now. I know that was over a decade ago, but I, I'm highlighting that now because it's still relevant. Like we need to, we need to know what we need in a given position, in a given role. We need to know uh, how this person is going to be able to help the team that feeds into our hiring that 100% should feed into our performance management process, whatever that looks like. Um, and it's only once we have clear objectives and metrics, and then we measure them that then we can do meaningful performance management. So anyways, I just, on the outset, I just wanted to kind of draw that connection because sometimes we think of these as completely separate things. And while they are unique, you know, domains within the HR function, they they heavily rely on one another. 
Absolutely. Actually, when I'm talking to clients about setting up their hiring practices, like one of the things I do is I work with a lot of startups on how to hire, you know, they close the seed round of series A, they don't know how to hire. One of the things I actually ask them to do is come up with the performance review for the person they're trying to hire. I actually tell them like, start there because mm -hmm. you need to know like what kinds of outcomes are you going to want to measure out of this job before you actually even begin to hire them? Like, what do you need? And that actually helps you figure out what you need. And in a very real sense, the performance management process is, are we getting what we need out of this person? And a lot of times we are great. We're going to try to help grow this person, develop them further, stretch them so they're ready for the next opportunity. In some cases, we're not. Uh, either they're subpar or they're just kind of barely meeting where we want them to be and we really want them to grow into their role. Um, so let's dive in and really talk about that. How do we, maybe we can start with kind of the traditional model, like what organizations have been doing for the last several decades and why that's insufficient and why we've started to see, you know, more and more organizations adopting a shift. Yes. I mean, the first thing I think we're seeing is that, you know, people are moving away from that whole once a year thing, but you know, in the yeah. past it was, you know, you get a once a year thing, you know, are you, are you on Santa's nice list? Or are you on Santa's naughty list? And are you going to get a raise or not a raise or a promotion or not a promotion? We're figuring that out once a year in a world that's uh, incredibly dynamic in a world where things are changing all the time, jobs are changing all the time. And so like, how do you know at the end of one year, you're doing this, you know, grand evaluation. I'm not saying that's a bad idea, but when we're doing only that and that thing by itself, it's not very useful. Also, it's not really coaching. It's more of a checkpoint. It's more of an evaluation. Yeah. And so yeah. it's sort of like, if you need people to grow, it's just sort of like, this is not going to help you grow. You don't really know what's going on and trying to explain what's happened all over the past year. Many managers don't really keep track. So there's a big recency bias in yeah. annual reviews. So they're, they're really, when you get your annual review, it's really just like the last three months and the nine months before that don't even matter. So this, this obviously has needed to go. Most companies know that, but I think that a lot of folks are still stuck on well, we need a way to know how to fire people. Everybody's very concerned with, you know, the CYA of firing people or of layoffs. And they're using performance management as that background for the CYA thing. And that's uh, CYA here being cover your <clears throat> actions. Yes. Uh, and that's not really the way to do performance management. If we want to manage performance, we really need to talk about how we're improving performance, focusing really on coaching instead of on evaluating and like basically if you're doing performance management correctly nobody should be getting fired on the basis of performance management systems right yeah oftentimes perform what performance management has been like you said it's a way to cover your butt it's a way to kind of post hoc justify why you're getting rid of somebody um but it's also a huge problem from an employment law litigation standpoint so often for what you what you see in performance management documentation doesn't even line up right like you, yeah. someone who's gotten like multiple years in a row of like exceeds expectations and then you're trying to claim you let go of them for performance issues right and so while, while i think it's been a checkbox largely for a lot of organizations from a, like a compliance standpoint from a a, a rightful termination standpoint etc uh, it actually has hurt many organizations because it doesn't actually line up. So on that basis, once a year, performance appraisals just don't work. Um, it, you know, I've heard the argument, well, is it better than nothing? And I, I don't know, like maybe, maybe it, do, maybe it is better than nothing, but I'm not sure it is better than nothing. I, um, I, I, I'm thinking right now, my own personal experience as a professor, you know, I'm at an institution and we have performance management that still functions in the form of annual performance reviews. So we have our normal, like for tenure track faculty, you have your third year review, your tenure review, full professor review, but in between we have annual reviews as well. Um, and, you know, maybe that's better than not having anything on an annual basis. No, but it's not. And the but, cobbler's children are going barefoot. <laughs> yeah, but I think for the most part, it doesn't because it, it gives this facade of like, we are being attentive to the needs of our people. We are um, coaching based on performance. We're 
training based on performance. We're making hiring decisions based on performance, blah, blah, blah. Like we, we make all these assumptions about these annual performance reviews, you know, to justify them and to say how valid they are, but are they actually better than doing nothing? Oftentimes I think the answer is no. Uh, and I think we're actually hurting ourselves because we're, get, we're, we have this false sense of security that, oh, we do performance management. We have a system. Um, so, you know, that means we're on the right track. But I can tell you, you know, not to throw my university under the bus, but our performance, well, I guess I will throw my university under the bus. You can throw any of, university a, under the bus like this. They almost all do the same thing. The the performance management system for faculty, it's a joke. Um, the timeline's a joke. The process is a joke. The value of it and like what we get out of it is a joke. And I say that as a department chair, one of my duties is to do these performance reviews for my faculty. So I do what the university requires me to do in terms of the annual performance appraisal, but I know full well, it's a joke. It, like it doesn't work as it is. And so as a, as a, as a department chair, what that means for me is I proactively have to on my own up, go above and beyond, you know, to do something meaningful, I have to go above and beyond what the expectation is. I have monthly one-on-ones with each faculty member in the department. Um, we, we talk about goals, we talk about growth, we talk about you know, all the different things they need support with. And that becomes a more real time dynamic way to provide mentoring, coaching, feedback, to help address performance issues when they arise, as they arise, and not wait, you know, for the arbitrary end of the calendar year or end of the academic year or the fiscal year or whatever, to try to address something that may have been an issue for a really long time, right? Absolutely. And so you bring up two really important things there. One of them, uh, the second one here is actually the idea that when, when there are performance management issues, what we end up doing most of the time is we tell people don't do that or that was bad. And you're not telling people what you want them to do. And so one of the most one of the biggest changes we need to see in performance management is we uh, is that we need to tell people do this instead of this. You need to tell people what you want them to do instead of just saying like, this is like, you did this, this was bad. You were getting reprimanded for this and so on, or, you know, stop doing that thing. You need to, you need to think in advance. What do you want instead? And what I find a lot of people are doing is they're saying, well, I know what outcome I want. Now you figure out how to get that outcome. And that's presuming that the outcome that they're looking for is reasonable. So no, you actually have to talk to people about the, how they get the outcome. I mean, yes, at the end of the day, there's a certain outcome that needs to happen. But if you don't like how they're going about getting that outcome, then you need to say, instead of doing what you're doing, you need to do this thing to get this outcome. But yeah. the weird part is sometimes that means you're changing someone's job. And a lot of people aren't thinking about the fact that when they do that, they're changing the nature of someone's job. This is not necessarily what they agreed to or what they signed up for. And people need to be patient with that. I mean, yes, jobs are changing. We're in a we're in a much more uncertain world. It's that whole VUCA thing that everybody's you know throwing around mm -hmm. volatile, uncertain, uh, chaotic, and so on. Right? That in that world, your job can change, and suddenly you know what you sign up for is not necessarily what's needed. Okay, you can adapt, but you're not necessarily going to adapt immediately. Performance performance management needs to keep that in mind. People don't adapt immediately. They're like people say things like, "Oh, we'll, we'll give you a week or two to change on this." nobody's changing in a week or two like this. It's insane. That's only, only the most surface level things, right? Yeah. Like you have someone who like, if, sorry to use the university example, if I have a faculty member teaching a face-to-face -face class and they're not showing up to their class, that is something that I can sit down with them and say, this needs to change immediately. And like within a week, you better start showing up to your class or there's going to be consequences. Yeah. That's fine. Most of the time when we're talking about performance issues, though, we're not talking about like easy surface level stuff like that. You're talking about ingrained attitude, behavior, interpersonal interactions, um, all those sorts of things that are, you know, it's built upon a lifetime of experience in how we function in the world. And you're not going to change that on a dime with somebody. They have to change, maybe change their mindset. They have to develop new habits, to develop new patterns, um, change their approach. That takes time. That takes continual effort, regular coaching, regular feedback, check-ins, et cetera. You're not going to, you're never going to flip on a dime. You say you have two weeks to fix this. No, it's just not going to happen.
It was, yeah, it was good. Also, performance improvement plans, similarly, are like, they're they're often, you know, first of all, the timeline of performance improvement plans is way too short. And most of the time when people are getting performance improvement plans, they're, I mean, that's just CYA for termination. But there's yeah. one other thing you mentioned earlier that I actually want to bring back here, which is that um, one of the reasons why the normal performance management system is worse than nothing is actually, I'm, I'm going to go back to the money ball analogy. Often because they're not using the right statistics. And when you're measuring yeah. something using the wrong stuff, that's worse than nothing. It's like using yeah. personality to figure out whether you should hire somebody. People say it's better than, you know, people say that that's actually useful. The only thing personality is might be better than nothing. But honestly, I can give you a lot of reasons why it isn't probably a discussion for another day. But also spoilers to anybody who hasn't seen Moneyball, you might want to hit that. You might want to turn off right now, but <laughs> One of the problems with uh, with uh, Moneyball that the, that the movie actually shows is that statistics work over a large group of people. And so, yes, statistics work over the season, but a post game, you know, the post season games and the series, it's seven games, winner take all. And, you know, as as was demonstrated in the movie, large number models don't necessarily apply to just seven games. And that yeah. won't tell you anything. And so when, when people are trying to take these, you know, large statistical models, oh, yeah, it's been largely shown on average. Things are like this. When you've got a small sample of people, that doesn't tell you very much. So like when you're looking at statistics about what people are like, and then you're looking at five candidates in your hiring pool, like the, your five finalists, you have to throw the statistics out the window now. They don't apply to your five finalists. There's only five of them. And similarly, when you're doing like performance management, what the averages, you know, can be, should be, whatever, everybody's different. Mm -hmm. So that people have, people have this feeling that if they put numbers to something, that then it's defensible. And like, yes, it's a great pretense, but in the reality, wrong numbers are actually worse than indefensible. It, it's the FOA objectivity, right? Yep. Like it, like it gives us a sense of we're being rigorous, we're being objective, impartial, and I'm like, uh, maybe, but you still have to, if you're scoring people on stuff, there's still object, there's still subjectivity there. There's still bias built in. You make a really great point. In the aggregate, we can make generalizations using large models, large data models, large populations, et cetera. Once you start to drill down though, into a small number of people for a particular type of a role, you know, you can be informed by the big data. But you have to start dealing with people person to person. Um, and you can only, it, you're really only going to see improvements once you have the, you if you've developed as a manager, if you've developed a relationship of uh, mutual accountability and trust with your team, you have regular check-ins, you have opportunities to have real conversations with people. Um, that's where you find yourself in a position where you can start to influence positive change, whether it's building on existing strengths of a person or addressing, uh, you know, some gaps or areas that they need to work on to improve. If you don't have a basis of and foundation of, of mutual accountability and trust with your team, uh, it's going to be really hard to get there. And you need to be consistent and you need to be committed to it over time. If you can't do that, then it's it becomes this checkbox thing. It becomes this superficial thing, and it's it's not actually going to manage performance. It 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 becomes like this this procedural activity. It becomes something so you have some documentation to show in case of a court proceeding. Uh, it doesn't actually do anything for the people involved, for the manager, or for the person who's having their performance appraised. Yeah, this is something like Goodhart's law that like once once you start to measure something, it ceases to be a good measure or something along or mm -hmm. once you make something once you make an outcome contingent upon a measure, it ceases to be a good measure. Because people game the system. And so like when you have these numerical systems, what people are gonna do is game it to get to their numbers. And uh, you know, funnily enough, we were we were actually talking earlier about the backlash on DEI. And one of the things that with that is that it's that people got too obsessive about the numbers. People start gaming the numbers and that's not how you do diversity and inclusion, but it's also not how you do performance management. I mean, what I would say is in general, the numbers have to go. If you care about performance management, you actually want high performance. It's all coaching. It's exactly what you said about what you're doing as a department chair. You want a good department. And uh, as, as I understand it, you've got a great department, one that's actually you know hitting the news quite often. And part of that's because when you're doing performance management, you're coaching people, you know, once a month. That's how you get performance. It's not the numbers. 
And it's not, you know, holding people to numbers or doing these annual reviews is the fact that you're going to have a great group when you're constantly working with everybody, making sure they're growing, making sure that they're getting the feedback that they need. And also, like, again, something that uh, um, the late Peter Taylor may rest in peace, he actually had a great system for this, plus Delta. Here's what's mm. going well. Here's what is great. Keep doing this. This is good. And actually, you know, mentioned this is good. And then Delta, go from this to this. Start changing some things. Change this thing to that thing. But that's the prep that managers need to do before they walk into the meeting. It's go from this thing to that thing. And I think that that planning is one of the most important things that we need to add to performance management uh, today. Even if you are going to continue doing the annual review because, you know, big companies, they're very slow to change. At least, you know, have the managers come in and prep that with, what they want to see happen instead of, you know, just don't do that or stop doing that. Change this thing to that thing. Replace this habit with this one. And then actually give people the time to adapt. Human beings were extremely adaptable. Something I find a lot of folks are not taking into account. So assume the adaptation. People can change. And by the way, they can even change when they don't necessarily agree with the change. So if you find yourself in a situation where you got to do certain things to make your job work, we can do that even if we don't like those things, even if we don't want to, we can do what we need to do. So, that, and that's another thing I think people really need to keep in mind. We can do what we need to do, even if it's not what we want to do. We do it all the time. Yeah, yeah, well said. Well, Oren, there's so much more we could talk about here, <laughs> but I know at the time I need to let you yeah. go. Um, th this will have to be it for today. Uh, but uh, before we wrap things up, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, uh, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Sure. So uh, folks can get in touch with me uh, via the Quality of Life Laboratory. So that's www.qllab.org, qllab.org. And almost all my work, my research, my consulting, it's all up there. People can find me there mostly. Um, occasionally I post on my blog on Medium. You can, again, find the link to that through my website. Uh, got some exciting new stuff coming down the pike this year. Uh, some stuff on flow, some stuff on diversity and inclusion, some stuff on performance management, which will hopefully be uh, showing up later this year. It's very exciting and uh, looking forward to hearing from folks. Wonderful. Oren, thank you so much. Oh, go ahead. I was going to, yeah, yes, yeah, for the last word, I was going to say like the, the key to performance management is really coaching, not defense. Like you're, you're looking, you're looking to build. You're not looking to protect. Mm, I love it. That's a great way to end. Thank you so much, Oren. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Jonathan. Always a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Oren can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.